Thank you. Okay, so good morning. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers of the conference. I missed uh, the first edition last year, so I'm really happy to be here today to share with you a, 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 f a few information about what's going on in the ARM world in the Linux kernel. So thanks to the, uh, the organizers. I think it's really great to have a conference in France about such topics, so thanks to them. So uh, the ARM uh, support in Linux has changed quite significantly over the last um, two years, two to three years. And I think it's, it's worth uh, making a summary of what has been going on, especially for uh, those of you maybe who are looking at the kernel, not necessarily um, with the ARM perspective in mind and, and have an understanding of what's going on. And before we get started, uh, who am I? I'm the CTO and Embedded Linux Engineer at Free Electrons. Um, I guess uh, our company is known by a few of you. We do um, um, embedded Linux development, kernel development. We also do trainings. And we're currently hiring, so if you have uh, some experience in those areas, um, do come and, and talk to us. We are interested. Um, I've been involved in uh, mainlining the support for uh, two Marvel SOCs, so two Marvel processors in the mainline Linux kernel. So it's a project that started uh, like a year and a half ago, and I'm involved in this project with other uh, free electrons persons. I'm also a contributor to BuildRoot, which is an embedded Linux build system, and I happen to be living in Toulouse at the moment. So what we're going to talk about today, uh, first, some background on the ARM architecture. Um, it's quite different from the x86 architecture in, in the way the ecosystem is organized, how the different companies are interacting together, and therefore how the technical solutions are designed. Then we look at some of the problems that existed in the ARM support some of the changes that, were, that have been um, made in, the, in, in Linux to solve those problems, and finally look at the timeline of what we've, we've done specifically for those Marvel SOCs to give you an idea of what are the different steps uh, to get the support of one ARM SOC in the Linux kernel. So first of all, uh, for those of you who have more an x86 background, the ARM architecture is really different in, in the way the ecosystem is organized. ARM is a company um, headquartered in, in, in UK that designs uh, ARM cores. So they define first ARM architectures, which basically is a documentation that says, I'm going to, to create a processor that understands this instruction, this instruction, that has an, a memory management unit that works this way, that receives interrupts this way, and so on and so on. So they basically define a specification of a processor core and its instruction set. From this uh, specification, they create ARM cores themselves. So those are not physical components, they are just designs in Verilog or in VHDL, uh, which, and they create implementations of their instruction set. And those cores that you can't buy physically are then taken by system and chip vendors. Uh, some of them are like Texas Instruments, Freescale, Atmel, uh, Marvel, and, and many, many others. Uh, ARM has over 100 licenses and probably even more, um, that buy the, uh, the right to take their uh, very log code and produce from them an ARM chip that includes the ARM core itself, so the, the, the part of the, the, the silicon that is able to execute the instruction and, and as the memory management unit and so on. And around that, they integrate a lot of other hardware blocks to do Ethernet, to do video encoding, to do uh, serial port, to do all sorts of peripherals that are more or less specialized. And then, uh, companies buy those chips and make boards. So those are PCBs on which you take a processor and around that you put connectors and other peripherals around it. So this creates a lot of variety in the ARM ecosystem. You have several ARM cores that have different capabilities and then you have hundreds if not thousands of different system on chips and each system on chip may use a different UR controller, a different interrupt controller, a different um, Ethernet controller, a different video encoding uh, unit, and so on and so on. So the variety is really huge. So they are really cheap uh, SOCs that are very, um, well, uh, poor efficient, and some others that are very expensive and that, that have a lot of complexities, depending on the market that the silicon uh, company is targeting. Uh, some examples. Um, two architectures here, so two different instruction sets defined by ARM, ARMv6 and ARMv7. ARMv6 is quite popular these days due to uh, the Raspberry Pi board. So the ARMv6 is an instruction set that's implemented in the ARM 1176 um, um, ARM core, so that's a, a core designed by ARM, which Broadcom has used in their system on chip, the uh, famous 2835. Uh, so they've taken that core and added more peripherals around it. 
Same thing here with the ARMv7, that there's different implementations. So those implementations are uh, uh, compatible from a binary point of view. You can take an executable and run it on Cortex-AA, Cortex-15, or PG4B, because they implement the same instruction set. But internally, the microarchitecture is different, but it's, it's not directly visible to the, the software developer. And from that, different SOC vendors um, do their own SOCs with different um, components around the processor core. So the name SOC, which means system on chip, means that you're integrating most of the components of your system directly into the chip itself. So instead of having like the Ethernet controller outside of your processor, like it would be on the x86 architecture, you plug a PCI card with your Ethernet controller. In the ARM world, it's usually inside the chip itself so that you have less components around the chip. And most of the feature is directly offered by the, uh, the SOC. There are also some companies that do not buy the ARM core, but instead buy, buy only a license to re-implement another ARM core that is compatible with the instruction set, that, for example, the case of Marvel with, the, with their PG4B um, ARM core. And then they use it in their SOC, and there are some boards produ produced around that. So if you look at the ARM system, a typical one, a very schematic view would be that one. So in the yellow box is the SOC, so it's really the chip. The, you can't see really what's inside, but what's inside an SOC is the ARM core and then a number of blocks. Uh, there can be um, several dozens of them. And then this SOC is taken to be soldered on a board, and this board has other peripherals that are connected using various buses. Could be the memory bus, an I2C bus, or many other buses. And the thing is that beyond the ARM core itself, there is a lot of freedom that is left to the SOC vendors. They can add whatever hardware block around the ARM core, organize them in whatever way they want. So it creates a lot of freedom, a lot of uh, innovation, a lot of creativity. But it also means that there is no standard for those devices. From one SOC to another, you won't have the same UART controller or the same network controller. And there is also no mechanism to enumerate the devices that are available. So, for example, you probably used to do LS-PCI or LS-USB and get the list of devices which are enumerated dynamically because the bus is able to do that. There is, generally speaking, in the ARM world, no such mechanism. So the kernel has to know in advance that it's running on such or such SOC, and this SOC has this number of hardware blocks and, and that are located at this place in memory with this encrypt, with these characteristics. So it's very different from uh, x86 in that sense. First, because of this lack of enumeration mechanism, and also because of the large number of SOCs that exist. So the old ARM uh, code organization in the kernel, um, it's of course mainly located in Arch ARM and also in drivers. Uh, drivers contain the device drivers themselves, and the Arch ARM contain more the, the, the SOC core uh, functionalities. So we have the core ARM kernel in Arch ARM, kernel, MM, lib, boot, and a few others. So that's really what is um, responsible for handling the ARM core itself. So it handles the MMU, the core interrupt, the syscalls, that kind of things that do not change from one SOC to another. This area is not so big because it's only specific to like the Cortex-AA, the Cortex-A9, and so on, which are reused by the vast majority of the SOC vendors. It's mainly worked on by ARM themselves. They do a lot of work to support this, this area to make sure their ARM cores are supported. So for example, they have already the support for the A15 and even for the 64 bits version of ARM. Uh, so not in Arch ARM, but in another directory. So ARM is doing a lot of work on this central part. And then in addition to supporting the ARM core, you also need to support the SOC itself. So the, the individual blocks are supported by drivers, but there is a lot of glue code that you need uh, to handle problematics like clocks, pin maxing, power management, SMP initialization, and, and various other things that are not really drivers, or at least were not really drivers. We're going to talk more about that. And so each SOC family, so either per company or per type of SOC, has a subdirectory in ARM. So if you have a laptop with the Linux source org, you can open that and see that there are a fairly important number of directories, like maybe 50 of them. Um, handling various SOC families from Freescale, from TI, from Marvel, and so on and so on. And inside this directory, you have SOC-specific code for those issues, to handle those issues, and also board-specific code. So for each and every board, you have a file that describes, okay, this board uses this SOC and has this device connected this way and this device connected this way and so on and so on. So that's more or less the way it used to be organized. So there are many two issues with this thing. Um, there is too much code. The code in Arch ARM started to be really huge. 
an exploding number of ARM SOCs that get more and more complicated. And the uh, historical maintainer for ARM, Russell King, uh, got overflowed by the amount of code to review. So normally he was supposed to factorize all this code and push it to, uh, to Linux, but he, he couldn't handle the load anymore. And so basically each, uh, what happened is that each sub-architecture team, so the sub-architecture teams are the teams that are handle one specific SOC family. So there's one team for the Marvel SOCs, another one for Freescale, another one for TI and so on, and sometimes several per SOC vendors if they have different families had started to push their changes directly to Linux to like make sure their code got, got merged because Russell King couldn't handle the load anymore. So it, it kind of worked, but the problem is that there is no more discussion between um, those teams and it started to, we started to have a lot of code duplications, uh, missing common infrastructures to solve the problems that are similar between SOC families. And so at some point in 2001, uh, Linus, that is uh, famous for his nice words, uh, it says, yeah, guys, this whole arm thing is a fucking pain in the ass. And it started to, it was kind of a starting point to start solving some of those problems. Another thing is uh, the need for multi-platform kernel. So on x86, you're used to build one kernel to rule them all. So you build one kernel and it boots on all your PCs. Of course, provided you've enabled the right drivers and so on. On ARM, it was not possible. You have to build one kernel to target one family of SOC, and it could boot on your OMAP platform, but it could then boot the same binary kernel on another board. You have to build a separate binary kernel, and then another one for a different family of SOCs. So we could support multiple boards using the same SOC in one single kernel, but we had to build separate kernels per platform. Why? Because until recently we didn't care much. ARM is mainly used in embedded applications where you build your system very specifically for one hardware platform. So anyway, if the SOC is changing, you are going to make a, a vast number of other changes in, in your system. So rebuilding the kernel is not a problem. But as ARM is used in more and more consumer uh, devices and the operating system on those consumer devices can be sometimes updated or changed by the user, think Android, think Ubuntu on tablets, phones, and so on, we, so people started to be interested in having the same capability as x86, build one kernel, and then be able to run it on whatever ARM platform exists. And this was impossible uh, due to a number of code organization problems, like each SOC was offering the same function. So you had, if you build two SOCs together, you have two pieces of code like that implement the function with the same name or header files location problems and all that kind of things. So it was also one of the goals. So we have two goals, kind of factorizing code, creating more common infrastructures, um, and also um, uh, making sure we can build a multi-platform kernel. So the first change that was done is uh, reorganize a little bit the maintenance uh, of uh, the ARM um, SOC code. So now there is a team uh, currently composed of like two to three persons. Normally, it, originally it was Arm Bergman and Olaf Johansson. And uh, Arm Bergman is currently on, on leave and so is replaced by Kevin Hillman. Uh, so both of them work for Linaro and Olaf works for, uh, for Google. So what they do is now Russell King continues to take care of the ARM core code. So anything that's part of the Cortex A8, A9, A15 support, and all the rest, what's SOC specific, is handled by this team. So this team has, is a bit larger and has more time to handle those, uh, those problems. And so all the sub-architecture maintainers know, instead of sending their code directly to Linux, they go through this team, which is responsible to have a, an SOC, um, a cross-SOC view of what are the problems and, and how the different things are solved in the different SOC families and try to find uh, when there is common code and make sure that the patterns are the same between SOC families and so on. And it, it, it really works. I mean, it's, it, it works because they see, hey, in this other SOC family that solved this problem this way, maybe we sh you should solve it the same way or even better, uh, make the code common in some other place and, and so on. And it, progressively, it makes the code better and better. So it reorganized the flow of code uh, from the uh, sub-architecture maintainers to uh, all the way to Linux. So for example, when I'm contributing kernel changes, I am sending my changes to the sub-architecture maintainers of the Marvel SOCs, and they are accumulating those changes until a few weeks before the merge window opens. They send it to this team, which accumulate the changes of all the sub-architecture maintainers, and then when the merge window opens, they send it to Linux. The second change, and probably the most significant one, the one on, on which I'm going to spend the largest amount of time, is the move to the device tree. It's the biggest change because it's probably 
the, the change that um, impacts the more uh, the, user, the user experience of our mechanicals. Um, so, as I was saying in my introduction, on, in the ARM world, most of the devices cannot be dynamically enumerated. So you need to have a, a place where you list which devices are present in your system, both inside the SOC and outside on the board. Um, so they have to, have to be statically described. The old way of doing that was to have a bunch of C code that register what we call platform device structure. So in the kernel, a platform device structure is a, a structure that represents a device, but that sits on what they call the platform bus, which is basically a kind of a fake bus to uh, represent the, the memory bus and all the devices that are on, on non-enumerable buses. Uh, so it's, you also have like PCI bus and, and USB bus and so on. The platform bus is one specific bus for those internal SOC uh, devices. And then each board was identified by a unique machine ID. So there was a, like a huge registration list of machines. And no, everybody could request a unique ID when you make, made the board. And whenever uh, the kernel was booted by a bootloader, the bootloader was passing a machine ID in a, some specific register. And thanks to this machine ID, the kernel was knowing, oh, OK, you're booting board blah, blah. And this board, blah, blah, I have some C code that matches this board. And I know this board uses this SOC with this device, this device, this device, this device, thanks to a lot of C code. So a big portion of the, um, of the stuff in Mac, some name, which is the name of your SOC family, um, was actually listing all those devices. So of course, there was some factorization between SOC families and so on. But still, it was quite a bu bunch of code. Uh, so the code looks like that. Uh, so when your board starts uh, and is initialized, uh, there is a bunch of platform device register calls that are made. And you pass it uh, the address of a platform device structure, which says, OK, the driver to use is that one. And this um, device is located in memory at this place and uses those interrupts. So it really defines where the hardware blocks are, what, are, what driver should be responsible for this hardware block, which, int which interrupt should be used, and sometimes there's other information as well that I haven't shown here. So it really describes which blocks are here. And this mechanism has been replaced by a hardware description that is now external to the kernel that we call the device tree. So as its name suggests, it's, it's a tree that represents the, the tree of the hardware blocks inside the, the SOC and on the board. It's a mechanism that's not specific to ARM. It's, it has been used on PowerPC for a very, very long time. Um, and it has, it's also used on Microblaze and ARM64, Extensa, OpenRISC, and, and other architectures in the kernel. So it's not ARM specific. It's also not Linux specific. It was, it's actually originates from the open firmware um, standard used on PowerPC. So it's not Linux specific. And the device tree is actually um, first a device tree source in text format that the developer writes to detail the, the organization of the system or the, of the hardware. And it gets compiled into a device tree blob, or so-called a DTB, which is binary format, which is faster to parse, a bit more space efficient also. Uh, thanks to a special compiler, the device tree compiler. So we have like the DTS, and then the DTB, and the DTC. The sources for the device tree are stored in Arch, ARM, Boot, DTS. So as we will see later, this directory is growing in size as the number of systems supported grows. And what happens is that at boot time, the kernel will parse the device tree blob to find what devices are available. So basically, instead of parsing some C structures, it's parsing this more specialized binary structure. Um, it's interesting to note that it's not specific to Linux, and it's actually used by other things. Um, and it's used, for example, by some bootloaders like U-Boot and Bearbox. They start to leverage the hardware description of the device tree uh, that can be shared between Linux and the bootloader um, to simply support new platforms. So here is an example, a very short example. Uh, I've removed a lot of things of what, it, what the device tree looks like. I'm not really going to go into the details because it, the language is, uh, would require a lot of ex explanations. But essentially, what we see here uh, this file defines the um, VCM2835 SOC. So it's the file that describes the SOC itself. And we have um, a, a node here that will in, uh, include all the hardware blocks that are inside the SOC. And we have here two hardware blocks that are shown, the interrupt controller. And we here mention which driver will actually be responsible for this um, hardware block. Uh, where it is located in memory, and then some other properties that are useful for various things. I'm not going to go into the details here. And here we have a second hardware block, which is actually a UART controller for serial port, which 
list a number of compatible, proper, uh, compatible strings which says, okay, this hardware block is actually the same as the ARM PL011, the ARM prime cell, and so on. And then the kernel will find if one driver is able to handle one of those compatible strings. So we're really saying, okay, my register set in this uh, hardware block looks like this, so I need a driver that is compatible with this or that hardware block. And then same thing, the interrupts, and then some other properties. Uh, one property I wanted to mention here is this one, status disabled. It means, okay, for, for no, um, this, I, this block exists, but I'm not going to enable it in that particular system. But in fact, this is only defining the SOC itself. What you will in fact need for a to boot a specific platform is a DTS file, which defines a board. So here it's very small. It only says, okay, this board, which is quite famous, has some memory, and you define the amount of memory. And then you here override the value of the um, property. So as you can see, we are including bcm2835.dtsi, which is actually this file. And include in device tree is not like in C, where it's just text that gets copy-pasted. It actually allows you to over override properties from the included file. So it's, it's actually a tree here that will be overloading the tree of the previous file. And this way, you can specialize progressively uh, the things until you describe your entire board. So in the, um, in the, the, the SOCs I've been involved in, the Armada 370 and XP, we have some common things between those SOCs, and then we have specific things to those SOCs, and the Armada XP, in fact, have different variants. Some are dual cores, some are quad cores, they don't have the same number of Ethernet interfaces, the same number of PCI Express interfaces, and, and other differences. And then we have the boards that use a specific variant of each SOC. So we can progressively refine the description of the hardware. So with the device tree, the user experience changes because instead of having just one kernel image, typically a U image when you boot with the U boot bootloader, where it contains the entire uh, hardware description directly built into the kernel, now you have in fact two files, the kernel image itself. There is no more a mechanism of machine ID. The, no, the kernel no longer contains any uh, description of what hardware blocks are available. Of course, it has drivers to handle those hardware blocks, but it doesn't know in advance which hardware blocks will be available and at what location, at what interrupt number, and so on. So when you boot with your bootloader, you actually need to load this file in memory, the kernel image, load the DTB, which is the device tree blob, so the binary compiled version of the files we've seen before. And then when you boot, for example, with uBoot, which is by far the most popular bootloader on ARM, you need to pass the kernel address then just a dash, except if you want to pass an, an init RAM disk, in which case it should be the init RAM disk address, and then the DTB address. And this way, the kernel will get started, fetch the address of the DTB, parse it, and find the hardware devices that are available. Uh, for, since this requires some support from the bootloader, uh, it needs to understand what a device tree is, uh, because sometimes the, the bootloader can also adjust values in the device tree. For example, it can uh, add your MAC addresses inside the device tree so that the kernel knows what MAC address to use for this or that Ethernet interface. Uh, but some bootloaders do not support the device tree, especially as we are migrating from a non-device tree world to a device tree world on ARM. Uh, so some bootloaders do not understand that. So there is kind of a, a legacy workaround to handle that situation. And the kernel has an option ca called ARM Appended DTB, where you can take your Z image, uh, directly append with cat, your uh, DTB and then create a U image from that and ask your bootloader to boot the whole thing so your bootloader still sees a normal kernel as it was before but when the kernel will start it will recognize there is a DTB at the end and will actually use it. So it's not like the, the best way of doing things because then your kernel image is, it starts to be specific to one board where while the idea is to move to a, a, a model where the, the kernel image is, is less specific to the hardware and the hardware description is passed as, as a, like a second argument. Here it's, it's well, less generic, but it allows things to move on while uh, companies and, and communities are updating the bootloaders to support the device tree. So U-Boot and Bearbox, both of them have support for the device tree nowadays, but as you probably know, on m many platforms we have to use some vendor-specific uh, versions of U-Boot, and they may not necessarily support the device tree at the moment. Um, this mechanism of device tree brings a notion of device tree binding. And the idea of the device tree, as I said, is that it's a data structure that represents the hardware. So it should not be specific to Linux. It should possibly be used by other operating systems. 
and it should not contain configuration. Like it should not contain uh, the decision whether you're going to use this or that capability of the hardware. That's a configuration decision. Like I am going to use DMA or not for this specific block. If the, if the, um, the block supports DMA, then the, the device tree can say it supports DMA, but it's not the responsibility of the device tree to deciding whether or not you're going to use DMA because that's configuration, not hardware description. So it sometimes poses a number of problems where you're not sure where to put this kind of configuration, but it's really hardware description oriented. The other thing is that the device tree normally is supposed to become part of the kernel API. The idea is that if a vendor takes a device tree, creates one for the, its platform, put it, with it together with its bootloader on the board, and the user should be able to upgrade the kernel to 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.16, 3.18, 3 and still continue to be able to run the kernel. So the kernel should con be able to read other device trees and remain compatible. So once a, a device tree organization has been decided, a set of properties, they're semantic and so on, it cannot be changed. You can add more, but you can, it cannot be changed. So a little bit like system calls, they become part of the kernel ABI. And the device tree bindings are actually the description of the, the set of properties and their meaning for a particular hardware block. So whenever you do a, a new driver, it no needs to have what we call a device tree binding, which defines how this driver and the hardware block uh, that this driver can handle will be described in the device tree. Uh, and so they must be very carefully designed because they will par be part of the kernel ABI. And this is now something that is slowly getting better organized. There, is, uh, there has been recently a new mailing list being created like in, in July or, or August, and there is a new team of maintainers that's responsible for reviewing those bindings before deciding, okay, they are, they are great. If you look at documentation device tree bindings, this is where you will find all the documentation for the existing device tree bindings. It's, at, in my, from my point of view, it's actually um, something that I'm a bit worried about because it's a huge increase in complexity. Um, hardware description is something that's highly tied to the, to the hardware and which changes quite often. So it's very difficult to design device tree bindings that are future proof. Uh, unless you have a really good understanding of where the hardware is going to go and how it works even today. Uh, so it's really difficult to, to define those, uh, those device tree bindings. And it kind of breaks the model of, of Linux where you start with something simple and then as your understanding of the problem progresses, you increase the complexity of the, your driver or your subsystem as you understand more of the, the, the issues that you need to solve. Here you kind of need to have a complete understanding from the beginning to have the, the correct binding at first. So it kind of breaks the, the, the development model of Linux in my opinion. So I'm personally unsure this ABI stability requirement is, is a good idea, but it's what has been decided, so it, apparently it's, it's, it will be the case. Another change is the multi-platform kernel. So this one is, isn't really like, um, uh, it's, it's a lot of little changes uh, all combined together that were needed. So I don't have a lot of explanation about that one, but essentially the idea is that no, you can build one single kernel then can boot either on all ARMv6, ARMv7 platforms on one side or on all ARMv4, ARMv5 platforms. You can combine them together for various uh, complex technical reasons, but what was the, the most important point is the ARMv7, ARMv6 platforms. Then you can build a single kernel that will boot on Marvel SOCs, on OMAP SOCs, on Tegra SOCs, on, on other SOCs from various vendors that have been converted to this mechanism. And here is really a set of changes all over the place uh, where instead of doing like compile time decision, uh, whether I'm being built for this SOC or that one, you need to switch to more runtime based decisions, sometimes based on what the, the device tree is saying, for example. Uh, also, you uh, should prevent two different platforms from defining the same symbol. I'm gonna give an example later on. Uh, there were issues with header files. Uh, also, they were, uh, they were passed, they were assuming that the SOC selected was this one, but of course, when you enable multiple SOCs, it, it no longer works. So there has been significant work being done to progressively clean that up. It's not being cleaned up for all the platforms yet, but most of the widely used ones are, are, have been cleaned up and support the, the multi-platform approach now. Um, another area where a cleanup was needed, uh, as I said previously, a lot of the Arch, ARM, Mac, something, uh, directories contain a lot of code to support uh, the core SOC um, uh, blocks. And one of the core SOC problem that needs to be solved by the kernel is handling uh, the pin muxing problem. So on ARM SOCs, you have so many 
usually so many hardware blocks that you can't you make use all of them at once because there are not enough pins around the, the SOC to actually use all of them. And so you need to make a choice and, and select whether this pin should actually expose the, the functionality of this hardware block or that one. So here I'm showing two pins outside of the, the SOC. That's, that's really the pins that you see and that you can actually solder where nowadays you don't see them because they are under the, the, um, the chip, uh, thanks to BGA, but they are there. And this, this pin, you can select uh, its software configurable, whether it should expose, for example, the data line of an I2C controller or the uh, master output slave input line of an SPI controller or the uh, transmit line of a UART controller or a, a simple GPIO. And this needs to be configured with a set of registers. And until, um, um, well, until some cleanup was done, each ARM subarchitecture had its own pin maxing code with a dedicated a API. So every time you switch from one uh, sub-architecture to another, you had to look at how their pin mixing was done and understand that. And in fact, the problem to be solved was mostly identical from one, one SOC to another. So it was like asking for some fac refactoring, which was done thanks to the pin control subsystem introduced maybe mm, two years ago or maybe a bit less, two years ago probably now. So it, it sits in driver pin control. And this subsystem provides an API to device drivers. So to the device drivers of those blocks, they can now say, OK, if you want to use the SPI1 controller, then I want this pin and this pin to be configured this way. So the device drivers don't know how to configure the pins. They just know, OK, I need the pins to be configured in this, fun in this functionality. And besides the um, uh, core, which provides uh, generic APIs to all device drivers, they are SOC-specific pin control drivers that each SOC family must implement, like the OMAP people, the Marvel people, they all need to implement that because the way the registers are, are, are used and the number of pins and their functions is highly SOC-specific. So each SOC needs to implement its own uh, driver, which sits in driver's pin control. So we've moved out of Arch, Arm, Mac, something, the code to handle pin mixing into driver's pin control. And connected to that, there is the GPIO uh, drivers because GPIOs are generally tightly coupled with, uh, with pen mixing that interacts with the GPIO subsystem and the RQ subsystem to generate interrupts on GPIOs. So that's like a side issue, but of very often connected to, uh, to pin mixing. And then the um, SOC DTSI file, so the device tree file that describes the SOC, will be able to say, OK, uh, if in, in this SOC, you can, for example, use the UART1 by configuring pin 2 in this function and pin 3 in this function. And then the board file, which actually decides what configuration will be used, can say, OK, I'm going to use UART1 in the configuration where pin 2 and pin 3 are used. So this way, it really uh, factorizes as much code as possible, first in a generic subsystem, then moves the hardware description in the device tree and the actual manipulation and configuration of the register in a specific driver. So it's obviously a bit more complicated than, than, than sub-architecture specific code, but it's also much more generic and uh, much easier to understand when you move from one platform to, uh, to another. Another uh, subsystem where uh, more or less a similar thing was done um, is the clock subsystem. So in, in such system on chips, all the peripherals are driven by one or more clocks. And they can usually be uh, software configurable because when you switch off a clock, you can save some power. Uh, you can also sometimes um, change the frequency of a clock to have more performance or uh, more uh, power savings and other possibilities. Those clocks are orga also organized in a tree. And so as I was saying, they are usually um, software configurable. For quite some time, the kernel had a simple API uh, to get, put a clock, and enable, disable it that were used by device drivers. So from the point of view of device drivers, they could just say, OK, I want to get my clock, and I want to know enable it, disable it. Uh, I want to release the reference to my clock. But each sub-architecture had its own implementation of those functions. So if you enable like the OMAP code, it had its own implementation of, um, I don't know, it's just changing the colors, not due to the connectors, I guess. So each sub-architecture had its own implementation of this, um, uh, this API. So first, it doesn't work for multi-platform, because you compile two sub-architectures. You have two definitions for the clock get function. So obviously, it fails at, at link time. But more importantly, it doesn't allow code sharing and common mechanisms. So the uh, common flag clock framework was introduced last year. 
Um, and essentially, it kind of follows the, the same idea as the pin control subsystem. We're going to have a common infrastructure that implements the those functions. So there is one implementation for clock get, clock put, clock prepare, and so on. And then behind this generic infrastructure, we're going to plug some uh, clock drivers. Some of them are basic, like a driver to describe a fixed rate clock. It's a clock at a given frequency. It's fixed in hardware, will never change. And can also implement custom clock drivers to handle clocks in specific SOCs that are configured in specific ways. And then the clocks are defined in a device tree. And you can associate in the device tree all the devices with their clocks. So it's, again, um, factorizing the code, moving the hardware description to the device tree, and leaving to specific drivers only really what's specific to the SOC. So we could summarize more or less uh, this change uh, with this. So now the device drivers continue to use uh, the, a the clock API. It changed a little bit, but not, not too much. Uh, in, in, in it's mostly the same as it used to be. But instead of being implemented on a sub-architecture specific way, it's now provided by a clock framework, which sits in drivers slash CLK. And behind it, you have drivers. Some of them are uh, completely generic. Some of them are um, very specific to a given hardware. And from the point of view of device drivers, it's completely transparent. Because the device tree says, this UR controller, if you want to use it, this clock needs to be enabled. So the device driver is going to say, OK, clock get the clock that the device tree says I should be using, and then clock enable it. And when you do clock enable, the clock framework is going to find which clock is defined by the device tree. And it's going to find which driver uh, is matching this clock, and then call the relevant operation in the driver. So it's really all about factorization. Another change is moving things out from ArchArm into uh, driver-specific directories. I think I've highlighted already two examples, the clock one and the pin control ones. Those problems were handled in ArchArm, Mac, blah, blah directories. And now it's being moved in, in drivers. So of course, it's, it's kind of a trick, because Linus was complaining about the amount of changes in the ArchArm directory. So by moving things in drivers, it kind of makes it disappear from ArchArm. And Linux only see drivers changes. And it's kind of a, a trick to cheat Linux. But it's, it's, it's not o only about that. It's also because by putting, for example, all the pin control drivers in one directory and have a maintainer that uh, overlooks the, all those drivers, then you have at least someone or even several people that have a, a view of all the drivers that exist and what, what issues they have and whether we could factorize more things and so on. So while the Mac blah blah directories were like kind of isolated and only the, the maintainer of this SOC was looking at what's going on in this code, now we have a maintainer for, for example, pinboxing that doesn't know much about the different platforms that are handled but acts as an overall maintainer that looks at what the individual drivers are doing and whether there is too much a du duplicated code and whether a new functionality in the framework is needed and so on. So it allows to recognize common patterns. It allows to look at what other drivers are doing to solve a given problem and so on. So generally, from a maintenance point of view, it helps a lot because the code is that handles the similar set of problems for all the hardware is more centralized and overlooked by a single maintainer. So that's really the idea of moving things to drivers beyond just cheating Linux. And it's, it's also being done for a number of other things. The RQ controller drivers used to be in Arch ARM and are being moved into driver's RQ chip. Um, the timer drivers are also were in Arch ARM and are being moved in driver's clock source. And same thing for PCI host controller drivers, same thing for some memory drivers or bus drivers, and that kind of thing. So a lot of the, the, the glue code that didn't have really a place uh, be, beside Arch ARM, Mac, blah, blah, is now being moved as drivers. So it, again, helps reduce the, the code churn in Arch ARM and make Linux happy, hopefully. So I've had a look at um, the adoption rate of those um, various functionalities. So I've just looked at the size in bytes of the source code in various directories, like driver's clock source, driver's RQ chip, driver's pin control, driver's clock, and Arch ARM boot DTS. And as you can see, from 3.4 to 3.12, uh, well, the adoption rate is quite huge. So of course, you can't compare really the absolute numbers from p pin control with RQ chip because pin control has a lot of much more code that is needed. So it's, it's kind of expected that it's much larger. But you, what's more important is that the increase in all situations is quite, quite high. And actually, a lot of ARM platforms are gradually being converted. And all the new platforms have to use all those new mechanisms. So it's a significant increase that we see over the last year, probably two years, three years and a half or so. 
So it's really, the movement is, is really strong in the direction of all those uh, new mechanisms. And now to kind of conclude that, and I guess we'll have some, some time for a question, which is, which is nice, not always the case when I do speeches. Um, here is a timeline of what we've done specifically for the ARM 370 and Armada XP, Armada, sorry, Armada 370 and Armada XP um, SOCs from one kernel version to another. Uh, so it's actually um, a set of SOC that um, the Armada 370 is single core, the Armada XP has dual core and quad core variants, and they have lots and lots of hardware blocks. But many of those hardware blocks already existed in earlier versions of those processors. Uh, like the Kirkwood family, which is uh, widely used in NAS devices, for example. And so uh, there are a number of drivers that we didn't have to write from scratch because they already existed in the kernel. And so the amount of work needed to enable certain features was relatively small. So I'm going to illustrate that on a, on a few cases. So we started in 3.6, uh, submitting 10 patches. And this was sufficient to get the kernel to boot on this platform up to a, a serial prompt with a user space. Uh, of course, the root, root file system was completely in RAM, thanks to initramfs, because at this point we had absolutely no storage, no network, no NAND, no, no nothing. But we could boot the kernel, interrupts are, are working, timer is working, serial port is working. So it's all you need, right? It's, it's done. So what we need to do that is just a little bit of uh, C uh, file and a few header files in, in your own Mac directory. So they still do exist. But the amount of code in here is, has been reduced a lot thanks to the movement of things to drivers. We had to add a timer driver to get uh, regular timer interrupts and also a clock source to get, uh, keep track of how the time is, is flowing. Uh, an RQ controller driver to handle the RQ controller. A little bit of code to handle uh, what is called early print K on ARM. It allows to get very, very, very early messages on the serial port. Even if your kernel crashes like very early in the boot, you get some, some stuff on the serial port. So it's a bunch of assembly macros to do a, a few, like just print a byte on the serial port, pretty easy. And the serial port driver, it's actually an um, 8250 compatible IP that Marvel is using. So we didn't have to write a complete driver just to say, OK, there is a new art controller at this address uh, in the device tree. And that's about it. We also wrote a basic device tree describing the SOC, describing the board. So at that point, it only had the description for uh, the timer, the RQ, the serial port, probably the memory, and a few other things. But it was, that was all. 10 patches, and it was, it was booting. That's what we got in in 3.6. 3.7, um, we did the pin control driver and the GPIO drivers. Uh, so they went in drivers pin control and drivers GPIO. And we did some uh, added a mechanism for uh, handling what they call address decoding. It's something specific to Marvel that allows to reorganize the physical address space in some funky ways. Um, so it's highly Marvel specific. But as we're going to see, we initially created in, in Mac MVEBU, which is our Mac directory. But we were able to move it into some other place later on. So we contributed 35 patches for this release, specifically for Marvel stuff. For we did some other contributions, but specifically in Marvel stuff, 35 patches. 3.8 was big, uh, 99 patches. We enabled SATA support and XOR support. So those platforms, as I said, are mainly used on NAS, so they have a lot of storage and RAID type of capabilities. And for those two, um, the drivers already existed and were compatible with the hardware blocks because they were reused by Marvel from other SOC families. So they really gained from doing mainline work because if they're reuse hardware blocks, we can reuse drivers and enable new SOCs more easily. So in that case, the only work that was needed is create the, um, the device tree binding for those drivers and add the corresponding information in, in, the, um, in the device tree. So it's, it's really simple to do. We added um, the network driver. So they, in this case, they didn't reuse an existing hardware block. It was a completely different one, a completely new one. So we had to write a completely new uh, Ethernet driver in that case. So this took quite a while. Um, my colleague did the uh, clock framework support. So in driver CLK, wrote a bunch of um, clock drivers that are specific to this platform. He also wrote the SMP support to get the four cores uh, booted. That's actually pretty easy. You need like um, less than 100 lines of code to uh, enable the SMP on your platform. And all the rest is using generic mechanisms in the kernel. Um, and l 2 cache support and then coherency support, that's also something that's specific to Marvel SOCs, but they are able to do hardware I.O. coherency. So you have uh, less uh, cache maintenance operation to perform. It's kind of a 
technically complex, but that's something Marvel specific that, that we did in, in this release. Uh, 3.9, um, many other hardware blocks enabled. And again, in this case, the driver already existed. The only thing we had to create every time is either create the DT device tree binding, or if it already existed, just add more information in the device tree files to say, okay, I have a USB controller at this location, and the interrupt is that one. And that's it, you have USB working. Uh, I have an SPI controller at that location. The driver is already in the kernel, so it's at this location in memory, this interrupt, this DMA um, properties, and so on. And that's about it. So we enabled a bunch of those things. And we also uh, enabled um, local timer uh, support. So it allows for on each uh, processor to have a, a timer that's specific to this processor, which helps in SMP. And RQ affinity to associate RQs with specific processors, which is also an SMP-related functionality. 58 patches. But as, the, as we were going through um, those steps, uh, some of the patches were actually related to bringing those new features. And obviously, a number of patches were also fixing problems introduced in, in previous versions or um, making some refactoring with other Marvel SOC families and, every, uh, and things like that. 3.10. Um, in 3.10, we started moving the address decoding code to driver's bus. So instead of having it in Arch R, Mac, MV, EBU, we started moving it here because it's actually a bus that is configurable. We started bringing the PCI Express support, which was my my duty, um, and we actually didn't manage to bring the entire PCI support in uh, 3.10. Uh, we had only the device tree description at this point. So the driver was not here, but at least the hardware description, uh, we agreed on, on it, and it was, it was merged in, in 3.10. My colleague did the LPAE support, so it's the mechanism on ARM that allows to address more than 32 bits of physical memory, so it's a bit like the PAE on x86. So until ARM64 is widely available, it's the hack that is used to uh, address more than four gigs of uh, physical memory. And um, we added a thermal driver to control the thermal sensor. So it's like a new driver, but pretty small, and 57 patches. So if you sum the, all the patches, it starts to be quite a lot, actually. And then in 3.11, we finally merged the PCI Express driver. It took a long time, but it's, it's in. We uh, were the first driver in drivers PCI host. So we created this directory. And we were the first uh, PCI drivers driver on ARM to use the device tree. So, and since we did that, there are like three other drivers that have been added in drivers PCI host. So it was long because we had to discuss the, the device tree binding a lot um, with various persons in the, in the Linux community, convince them on how our hardware is working, which was quite complicated, and, and so on. So it took a long time because we were like pioneering the, uh, the new style PCIe support in the kernel. We also added in driver's memory, uh, driver for what is called in the Marvel uh, chips, uh, the device bus. It's actually the memory bus on which you can connect devices such as a NOR or a NOR flash or a, an FPGA that's mapped in memory or anything that's connected on the memory bus essentially. So one of our colleagues did, did this work. So 66 patches, but as I said, again, some patches were related to those functionality specifically, and some others were like making some refactoring and fixing a few things. And obviously, as the state of ARM support is evolving, if we want to uh, remain a, a, a nice architecture in terms of support, we need to make sure that we continue to support the new features of the clock framework or the pin control framework and that kind of things. So that also takes a kind of a maintenance load over time. Yep. So Sorry. No, it's it's not. In fact, the driver itself is is quite small. So first of all, from the point of view of PCI devices, it's completely transparent. I plug um, like a. Um, uh, e E1000 uh, PCI card, and I can use the, the E1000 uh, driver with no change. So from the device driver side, it's completely um, uh, the same. Uh, from the host controller, we need a bunch of uh, functions to tell the kernel how to access the PCI configuration space. Um, and in our driver, it's a bit complicated because for each PCI device, you need to create uh, configurable uh, physical windows so that the, PC the CPU can see the PCI uh, device through the bus. And um, in the case of the Marvel SOC, those windows are configurable. You don't have an unlimited number of them, so we need to create a fake PCI bridge and emulate it 
and trap the the uh, the accesses that the kernel is doing to this PCI fake PCI bridge to configure those those windows. So it's really specific to this um, driver. But in fact, the, the code is not that large. Most of the code is about this emulation of the bridge. And the biggest part of the discussion was actually on this bridge and on the device tree rep representation. That's really the two most important points. But in fact, in the end, it's not so complicated. Um, in 3.12 RC1, which, been, which has been released uh, very recently, we've uh, made a number of progress um, again. Um, MBUS has been improved uh, compared to the previous version that we merged here uh, by adding device tree support. Uh, until now, it was com some kind of fixed thing. Uh, discussing the device tree support for that um, took probably several hundreds of emails uh, in discussion with the community. So it's been really, really, really long to sort out how to define the device tree for that. Uh, we've started uh, bringing a few patches to support NAND. So at the moment, it doesn't work, but it's a number of cleanup patches have been added in here. For example, on NEN, um, the Marvel is using an, an hardware block that Marvel is also using in some completely separate SOC family, the PXA family, which comes from another division of Marvel. But the hardware block is almost the same, but has more features. So we have to reuse the same driver, because in Linux, we don't want two drivers for the same hardware block, and we have to extend it. But in some, in some situations, it's actually more difficult to have an existing driver and need to extend it because you need to keep the compatibility of with the old hardware that you don't necessarily have. So you need to interact with other people that have access to this hardware and can make sure you're not introducing regressions. So it takes a lot of time. So a number of cleanup patches went in. I've started um, bringing the MSI support. So it's a specific mechanism for interrupts on PCI. It's uh, a part of it was merged, but not all. And I've also worked on Big Endian um, support to execute the kernel in Big Indian mode, while normally ARM is, is Little Indian, so I've mostly fixed the number of drivers so that they work nice in, in Big Indian mode. So that's more or less the timeline that we've followed uh, since uh, a year and a half, so that's really the work of a, a year and a half to bring more and more features of an SOC in, in support in, in the main line. Uh, so if you want to like do the same, um, mostly you have some code coming from the vendor, just throw it away. Usually it's horribly ugly, it doesn't use the device tree, it's, it's just going to, you, to give you eye cancer, um, so just throw it away. It might be useful sometimes to have a better understanding of the data sheet when the data sheet is not clear enough, but that's, that's all of what it's useful for, most of the time. Sometimes it's from one vendor to another, it's it different, but in our case, it's, they are really not doing any codes in a mainline style, so it's uh, really, really horrible to look at. Start small and send code pieces by pieces. Like, w as you've seen on the timeline, we didn't wait to have the whole thing working to submit patches. Because submitting patches takes a while, and while this discussion is ongoing, you can start working on the rest. So as soon as you have something minimal that boots, start submitting that, and then in parallel, work on the next features and submit them, and then continue to work on the next one, and so on, like kind of a, a pipeline mode uh, to make progress as you go, and especially also because the community isn't able to handle hundreds of patches at a time. So if you go in the community and throw hundreds of patches, it's never going to be merged because no one will have the review bandwidth to look at all this stuff. So you submit like patches by small patch sets, 10 patches, 20 patches maximum. If it's, if it's more than that, then you're never going to be looked at. Comply with the latest infrastructure changes. Today, if you want to bring um, support for an ARM SOC, if you're not device tree, clock framework, pin control, your code is just going to be thrown away because no one wants to see um, old style code merged in the, in the kernel. The place to be in the ARM world is the what we call the LAKML, the Linux ARM kernel mailing list. It's a mailing list that has a quite important traffic, uh, but where all the ARM discussions are happening. And it's actually nice to be on this mailing list if you're interested in ARM to um, see what's going on, where things are moving, and so on. And if you want examples, there are a bunch of recently merged sub architectures. And so we've been working on MVBU. One of my colleagues is working on All Winner SOC, which is in Mac Sanxi. And there are a bunch of others that have been merged recently. And there are good examples. For example, if you look at older architectures, I would take like uh, OMAP2, uh, which is in the Mac OMAP2 directory. They are gradually moving to these infrastructures, but since the code, they have a lot more code, it's a lot longer for them. So they are not the best examples to look at a nice, um, uh, a nice and clean way of doing new SOC support in the kernel. 
So in August 2012, it looks like um, Linus was mostly satisfied with the changes. Over the last year, ARM has gone from a constant headache every merge window to an outstanding citizen in the Linux community. That's actually Linus who said that. That's amazing, right? So it, it looks like the problems are solved. But as we could see uh, in this um, in this in this file um, in this graph, where the size of the device tree is growing and there is say, there is obviously a lot of changes going on in the device tree. People in the community started to worry uh, without telling it too much that Linux may complain someday about that. And obviously in September 2013, so just this, um, earlier this month, they are they still really despise the absolute, absolute incredible shit that is non-discoverable buses. So he hates the fact that you can't do LSPCI and discover the devices on ARM. And I hope that ARM and social hardware designer all die in some incredibly painful incident. DT only does so much, so he seems to really like DT, but in fact not that much. Questions? We have like four minutes and 45 seconds left for questions. Yeah, please. Yeah, if you will, but do do. Is it working? No? It, it is? Okay. You need to talk really close to the mic, not like... Hello. Yeah. I'll works. return to my place to a safe distance from you. I don't know if you like my question. I have uh, read some uh, discussion about DT versus ACPI. And my, I have two questions, actually. I don't understand it exactly how ACPI can do similar stuff than DT. And uh, what's the point? Because it seems like a passion thing. It's Some people love one, some people love the other. And they don't agree at all. Yeah, um, unfortunately, my understanding of ACPI and UEFI generally is quite poor. So I'm not really uh, well placed to have a, make a good comparison between the two solutions. Uh, but uh, my understanding is that yes, ACPI is uh, also here to provide a hardware description. And um, so therefore could be in some ways a, a replacement for uh, the device tree. And, and there is actually some discussion going on to use UEFI on ARM. And even some of the people who uh, were originally pushing to use the device tree on ARM are now pushing to use the UEFI instead, which is kind of uh, crazy because three years ago they were like telling everyone we should do a device tree, we should do a device tree. And now they are saying we should do UEFI. We should. And I, I don't know. Honestly, I, I don't have a good um, technical understanding of uh, ACPI, UEFI to really honestly make a, um, a good comparison. So I, I don't know. Yeah. But it's, it's more or less the idea with the device tree as well. Ultimately, the idea of the device tree is that the vendor can write its device tree source compile it into a device tree blob, include it into the hardware, much like it includes a BIOS, for example, or with ACPI tables and so on. And then, then a user can take a kernel and put it on the hardware, and it will read the device tree, much like it would read ACPI tables, and, and the kernel would boot. So it's kind of to try to mimic the same uh, type of situation. Not sure if it's going to be the case, especially due, the, the, due to the problem it, it causes to maintain uh, ABI stability around the, between the device tree and, and the kernel. But if, if it works, it, it could more or less mimic what's uh, happening on the, in the PC world. Yeah. Um, do you think that the new organization of the code, which uh, improves uh, code reuse, could convince uh, some uh, manufacturer to drop their BSP code in the future <laughs> and uh, try to reuse uh, already existing code? Um, I don't think it's making a, a lot of changes, because the arguments to go mainline are pretty much the same as they were. Uh, for sure, it makes the code a little bit cleaner, maybe encourages a little bit more reuse of code, so it's probably a bit easier in some ways. But on the other hand, you have the device tree that is triggering a lot of discussions that were, didn't exist in the past and that are, ta that are taking a lot of time. Um, so I don't think it's changing the situation so much. The arguments are pretty much the same. It, once your code is merged, it's maintained over time and it's moved uh, on the new APIs and so on and so on. Right. So it's all done for free for the, by the community, more or less. So I don't think it's changing the arguments too much. But f for the manufacturers, uh, the main uh, uh, motivation is uh, the time to market, in fact. So they, uh, they don't care about uh, mainlining their code, but if they can uh, reuse existing pieces, for example, the, the NAND driver, uh, which could be derived from the PXA uh, driver, uh, could have been less work than uh, rewriting a new driver from scratch, for example. Right. 
Um, so I believe, obviously, the way the community is working is really hard to, um, to combine with the constraints of tied to market from manufacturers. So usually what they do, or what I think they should do is, of course, they should have some, some line of canal development internally where they do their own stuff without caring about the community and just, they just go straight to solving the problems and have the product shipped and, and so on. And to, in parallel to that, I know it's kind of a, a cost, of course, but it, there's not much other choice. In parallel to that, have uh, a more long-term uh, view and say, okay, if I'm going to mainline the support for Armada 370, Armada XP, then for the next SOC, this code will be part of the mainline. Mm. So when I will internally bring up my next SOC, many of the hardware blocks that I will reuse will already have their drivers in the mainline kernel. For, for, of course, I will have more still some efforts to do for this new SOC, mm. but for the rest, it's already in mainline. So it's kind of a, um, you do the N. Um, stage internally and you're doing the mainline work so that the n plus one stage internally will be more efficient so it's really a long-term view so we're currently bringing a new soc i don't know if the name is public and so on but we have uh, we have a new a new soc and it's reusing a lot of hardware blocks that uh, exist in uh, the 370 and the xp and there are therefore a lot of things that we will be able to to use uh, without much uh, effort thanks to the device tree and the existing drivers there is a question over here. Yep. Um, you're, you're saying the vendor will have to write his own DTB and put it in the hardware and the kernel will read it. How will the kernel discover the DTB blob? Well, there is a protocol between uh, the kernel and whatever is responsible for booting the kernel, usually a bootloader, but it could be whatever. And this protocol says you need to pass the DTB address in this register. So then it's, it's up to the platform be it U-boot, be it some custom bootloader, whatever, to boot the kernel in some s memory location and passing in some register the address of the GTB. So there is a well-defined protocol to, to solve this, this question. Probably is going to be the last question, I believe, because yeah. it's saying over since quite some time already. Uh, today, if we are considering x 66 Intel is one of the biggest contributors of the Linux kernel. Right. And I was wondering how much the SOC vendors are participating directly or indirectly, maybe through free electron to the Linux kernel. Uh, they are doing a lot more work than they were doing. Um, I think if you, the, the Linux Foundation has published uh, just a, a week ago or so a, a report on the contributions from like you know, 3.2 to 3.10, so the, like the last two years or three years, I'm not sure exactly. And you can see that, um, of course, Intel is still amongst uh, the, the top contributors, Red Hat is still amongst the top contributors, but just next to them is Linaro, a consortium of ARM silicon vendors. And then be below that, there are a number of other SOC vendors. So you will pro see in the list Texas Instruments. You will see um, Freescale in the list. Um, and probably on, uh, some others I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting at the moment. But if you combine all them together, uh, the contribution of ARM vendors is more and more significant. And I think there is something that's slowly changing is that up to a few years ago, the ARM vendors were mostly focusing on just bringing their hardware. And they were not caring about improving the overall uh, infrastructures that were needed to make the ARM support better. But thanks to, well, the mainline um, uh, need uh, becoming more interesting for um, SOC vendors and the Linaro consortiums and, and various other things, they are not realizing that. So we are saying, like, uh, the pin control subsystem has been done by a guy from ST Ericsson, uh, and it's really framework uh, mm -hmm. effort. It's something to make the overall code better, not just to enable one specific platform. The clock framework is coming from a guy uh, that works for TI. Um, and it's, uh, Samsung is also doing a lot of work on memory allocation to solve um, problems uh, faced by video drivers and multimedia drivers in general. So they are doing some core um, memory allocation uh, patches and improvements to solve these problems. So they are more and more uh, entering a really core kernel development to make uh, the ARM support better. So it, it, it has taken some time, but I think the shift is, is well, uh, we're well on the road of um, having SOC vendors contributing, contributing more and more significantly to core kernel infrastructures. Thank you. Thank you.